We now know the fate of Kim Potter, the former Brooklyn Center police officer shot and killed Dante Wright last year after mistaking her gun for a taser. Today, a judge handed down a 24 month sentence, which is far less than the state's recommended minimum of seven years for manslaughter. We want to bring in local attorney and political specialist Abu Amara to talk about the judge's decision and the other issues surrounding the case. Abu, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, let's just start at the most obvious part. Uh, what did you think of the sentence? Well, I expected a downward departure. Um, I did not expect it to go as far down as 24 months. I thought it would end up in the range of uh, three to five years. Um, I thought based on the facts of this case, uh, the officer here made a mistake, but mistakes are often held accountable and I thought it would be a bit higher. So um, I, there are gonna be a lot of people disappointed. There are two things that will always be true after this day. And the first is that Dante Wright is gone forever and his family will always be in pain. And the second that will always be true is that Kim Potter will forever be a convicted felon and serve time in Minnesota prison. Yeah, certainly on that. So so uh, you thought maybe three to five, uh, a, a, a lot of people, uh, the family thought seven. Uh, talk about her, her reasoning and, and how, uh, as an attorney, you see her getting to, to 24. Months. Yeah, well, I watched I watched what Judge uh, Chu explained prior to the sentence, and it was pretty comprehensive. Uh, talked out, talked about how um, Kim Potter, it was in, it was indisputed that there was a mistake made that leans towards a mitigating factor. It was explained that um, the circumstances around it weren't a George Floyd where you had an officer on uh, the knee on a neck, or it wasn't a, a newer circumstance where you had an officer recklessly shooting outside of their own car. It was an officer lawfully in place executing a warrant, I'm sorry, executing um, a lawful activity, and it went awry. And so those mitigating factors leaned in favor of the judge uh, reducing the sentence beyond what typically would have happened in a circumstance like this. And, and you brought up the, uh, the, you know, the Chauvin George Floyd, which I, I, I don't know anyone who doesn't think that was an egregious, uh, you know, horrific thing. But she brought up Derek Chauvin and she brought up Mohammed Noor, the, uh, the police officer who a couple years ago shot and killed Justine Ruschek Damon in a dark alley. Uh, why bring up those cases? Yeah, yeah great question. I, I believe they were brought up because part of what's happening now is we're operating in a context, right? It's not simply just this case. And I suspect Judge Chu felt that she had to explain not just to the people in that courtroom, but to the public at large, why she was departing from those sets of circumstances. Now, let's be clear, in the case of Derek Chauvin, that was a murder uh, uh, issue. That had nothing to do with the manslaughter that we see here. And in the case of Mohammed Noor, that was originally a third degree murder conviction, ultimately went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, overturned that. Um, but th she was distinguishing between those two cases because it was important to explain if you're gonna depart from those precedents, you've gotta explain why. And she spent some time doing that today. I, I talk about that context because I think it's really important, you know, as we get into the, these race issues and, and the fact that people are, are so emotional, a number of people, are very upset about about uh, it not being a stronger sentence. When you, you know, I heard Ben Kremp say, uh, this is apples to apples, it's the same case. Mohammed Noor and uh, a black police officer and now a white police officer, Kim Potter, both found guilty of manslaughter, both different sentences. I, I mean, is it apples to apples? There Aren't there different facts? And, and I guess more importantly, is that helpful when, when Ben Crump says something like that? Well, look, it may be apples to apples, but as we all know, there are various types of apples, right? And so even when there are similar circumstances, you can have strains that make it different. Um, to the point about Ben Crump, I'm not gonna blame him for being a zealous advocate and advocating for his clients. Um, that's his job, that's his role. Um, but I do think it's important to distinguish between these cases. There are some important nuances. In the case of Mohammed Noor, that was an officer in their car shooting outside of their car to an approaching person. That is a different circumstance than we have here where there was a lawful stop. Um, in the case of George Floyd, I think everybody agrees that that is a fundamentally different circumstance where you have an officer committing a crime, an assault, um, for nine minutes. That is a very different circumstance than a lawful stop. Now, I will say this. There, there is no question that African-Americans have felt for a very long time 
that they have not received fair justice under the law. And this case will be a, another example of that to many. Um, and I hope that those of us who are disappointed by the sentence um, get activated. If, if you're concerned about why does the law provide this type of outcome, you should be engaged. But we also have to accept the verdict. And that is exactly what Attorney General Keith Ellison said a couple of hours ago, that our disappointment can't be in giving up on the system. It has to be about accepting this verdict, but doubling down and committing ourselves to doing the work of racial justice uh, in our society. Uh, here, here's what Ellison said. He said, I accept her judgment. I urge everyone to accept her judgment. I don't ask you to agree with her decision, which takes nothing away from the truth of the jury's verdict. He then went on to say, you know, he asked a lot of questions. He was like, how can we make things better? What can we do now? Maybe, maybe Kim Potter herself can come back and be an advocate with manufacturers of tasers to, to make them look different. I, I, I found, I, because I know the attorney general can be a lightning rod and a lot of people really... Uh, completely believe in what he says and does, and a lot of people don't, don't care. But uh, I thought he was so measured about what he said today. Um, what did you think of it? Well, I generally find the Attorney General pretty measured um, in his approach. And I think the measurement here comes from looking at the facts, right? If you're looking at the context and history of, of policing and communities of color, that can be one that is uh, uh, activating it's going to mobilize a, a large group of people because that history is in fact true but in the specific facts of this case there's more nuance here it's not simply an officer committing a quote-unquote murder um, there's a lot of mitigating factors here that make this thing different and so um, that measurement comes from just grounding yourself in the facts of this case and that's what our justice system ultimately is supposed to do it's supposed to be rooted not in what's happening generically in society or has always happened in society it's supposed to be based on what are the facts of this particular case in this case uh, the attorney general's measured uh, response i think is proper uh, the, the, the part that's not measured is the real emotional stuff, and, and, uh, and this is tough because, you know, you're talking about uh, parents and children, and, and Dante's mother, Katie, was, she was actually upset that the judge got emotional and, and, and had some tears uh, when she delivered the sentence. Uh, you've been in court a lot. How often do you see a judge get emotional herself or himself during a sentencing? Look, judges are always supposed to maintain impartiality. That's their role. Um, we also have to remember these are human beings. These are difficult circumstances. And so I don't begrudge a judge one way or the other in terms of how they respond so long as they're responding in a way that is fair to each of the parties. Um, and so I don't look too much into that, but I don't want to dismiss the, 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 the feelings of the Wright family. The fact of the matter is the only party here who received any type of life sentence, quote unquote, is the Dante Wright family, that they will never see their child again. And so when they're responding out of that pain, out of that hurt, we've got to have some empathy and understanding um, for where they're speaking from. Which I guess leads me to the big question, how, how do we collectively get better? I mean, how do people have a little more empathy for the right family? And then how do maybe people on the other side go, you know what, I heard the judge, I heard her explain what prison is, I, I, I understand maybe, or I, I want to try to understand why, why she gave 24 months. I mean, I know these are, huge, really tough questions, but you, you mentioned that people should get activated and involved. What, what else can we do collectively to get better, Abu? Well, first and foremost, I think all of us, each, we need to listen a bit more. Um, that, you know, every so often we hear a case involving an officer killing a young black person. And at times we try to lump all of those together as if they're the same case all the time. And yes, there is a trend line, don't get me wrong, that there needs to be policy change. But I hope we do a bit of listing on each and every one of these cases to understand the facts that give rise to that lawsuit, to that prosecution. Um, so the first thing I think we need to do is a little bit of listening. The second thing is I think each of us, whether it be on issues of policing um, and criminal justice or elsewhere, we've got to get more engaged in terms of what are the policies that are leading to these outcomes. And if you're, you're not happy with those, get engaged, get active, talk to your legislators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's part of how I think we get to this end of justice because so often the term justice is thrown around loosely um, and what that means. And in our society, in the criminal justice system that we have, all it guarantees you is a process, a fair process. 
Um, anything beyond that, you've really got to take to some other folks and other stakeholders to, to make true. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, well, well said. Uh, what else is important uh, that you want folks to know that I'm, I might not ask you as we wrap up our conversation here? Well, I think it's important for us in, in, in this case, despite the, the pain that may be out there, um, is to remain hopeful um, that despite this outcome, many people who will be disappointed in, um, just in the last six to eight months, Minnesota has shown itself to be um, a leader in terms of holding um, public officials accountable, officers accountable when they commit crimes. And just as the case here, folks may not be happy with the sentence. And I understand that. I, I get it. I, I, in fact, thought it was a bit low. But the truth remains that Kim Potter is a convicted felon under Minnesota law. Kim Potter will serve time in Minnesota jail. And I think we need to point to that as an example of our progress in holding all public officials accountable, officers including, um, and then build on that to make sure we get to a place where um, we have confidence, not only in, in public safety, which is again, a real thing. We have threats to public safety and we need officers to be a part of that solution. But at the same time, when officers do wrong, that they'll be held accountable. And that's what our system has to guarantee. And that's what I'm hopeful. Uh, people will kind of hold on to in this moment of, of pain. Abu Amara, we uh, certainly appreciate your, uh, your time and insight and your thoughts today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, uh, we'll continue uh, with coverage of the uh, Kim Potter sentencing uh, and the uh, aftermath today on WCCO television and always on CBS News Minnesota.